much. Let me start with uh, saying that I am uh, a little bit angry that uh, uh, Yuri Gerebi spoke about uh, the Kirchner speech and analyzed Peter Orban because I consider myself as a sort of Orban specialist as well, so I, uh, I am a little bit now uh, that feeling that maybe it was a mistake to invite you. But thank you. Uh, now, uh, our, my, our topic is certainly very much colorated, what you said, and let me start that, uh, that uh, what you, uh, what Yuri spoke about is actually coming back into the debates uh, this year inside the European Union. Uh, Viktor Orman wrote an article uh, in Magyar Nemzet, which is a very right-wing uh, newspaper close to Fidesz, uh, and uh, the same article was published word by word in the German newspaper Die Welt. Now, uh, in the same uh, issue, the, the uh, Chief uh, editor in chief of the Welt uh, has written an answer to to the article of Viktor Orban, which is, I think, in itself a strange uh, method, and he exactly criticized some of the points uh, in Orban's uh, article what Yuri spoke about. He explicit, explicitly spoke about the Narodnik argumentation of uh, Viktor Orban when Orban wanted to represent the people uh, against all sort of uh, strange uh, uh, and uh, uh, speculants and other people who dislike the new uh, basic law uh, in Hungary. And he also realized the argumentation or the attitudes of uh, Orban when uh, he said that there are people who just want <coughs> to discuss issues for the debate itself, and certainly in a German culture, a political culture, this is a very bad argumentation. So I think what you were talking about is already on a European level debate. Uh, but let me concentrate on the uh, second part of the title of our panel, how to evaluate the Hungarian presidency. But before that, I just would like to come back for a minute to the first part of our title, and that is success or failure, because I think there will be some internal debate, especially in future, for how to, uh, what, what is success and what is failure. But I mean it not only because of our probably different approach, but because of the uh, Hungarian context. Uh, this question whether the EU presidency, the Council presidency, the six-month-long period, uh, the Hungarian mission uh, has been a success or a failure is the most typical approach in the Hungarian media in the domestic, domestic political discourse, although there is not too much debate about this issue at all. But today, these categories mostly reflect a simplistic black and white relation. And as I mentioned to you, uh, failure can be classified as a statement against the government, whilst uh, success is a core notion of the PR rhetoric of the current uh, government. Uh, the first version, success, means or claims that Hungary has been widely praised because of its professional performance inside the European institutional setting, whilst according to the counter-argument, this success has become impossible because the presidency, in a narrower sense, uh, uh, cannot be, uh, uh, must, it's impossible to separate the presidency from the, uh, the fulfillment of administrative tasks professional or not, from the overwhelmingly negative judgment of the Hungarian political tendencies. Also, it is often important, and this is another problem, whom to blame or who, whom to praise regarding the rapidity or slowness of high political and intra-institutional deal-making inside the European Union. So is it the success of the Hungarian presidency that Croatia finally has reached the stage of its uh, accession process and it will become a member state uh, probably very soon? And is it a success that we have a new European Roma strategy? Or then, is it a failure that Romania and Bulgaria still have to wait probably some months before they get to the, the final approval to join the Schengen zone? 
And is it the mistake of the Hungarians that the package of six regulatory legislative measures in order to strengthen the European economic governance has not been approved by 30th of June, and it will be approved probably in, in two months. But uh, I would like to remind us that the mainstream Hungarian political forces waited for this opportunity for a long time, since the day of accession. First of all, pro-European elites hope that this important and salient function inside the European political and legislative decision-making processes would help the internal Europeanization of the country and might strengthen the European identity of the mainly Euro-pessimistic public, especially if Hungary is able to show the capabilities of leadership, finally, inside the European Union, and we do not only have to follow the others, the big and old member states. According to this wish, or maybe wishful thinking, a growing media attention would give a chance to the uh, citizens to learn more about the political world of the EU. Secondly, uh, in the perception of Hungarian politicians and civil servants, the rotating presidency was supposed to be a special opportunity to verify the maturity of the Hungarian EU membership to other member states and the European institutions and then we might forget about our obsessions about so-called secondary membership. So, thirdly, there was a hope that Hungary might contribute to the progress of the integration process because it has some special involvement in some policy areas and might initiate European solutions in some fields which might be less important for other member states as a newcomer, as a new post-communist country, and as a central European country. So I would argue that instead of using success and failure, we might think what we really wanted to do. Now, first of all, the internal Europeanization of the Hungarian public through education has not happened according to the original positive scenario. Just the opposite. The rhetoric of the Prime Minister probably widened the gap in the attitudes of his followers uh, between the European Union as such and Hungary uh, in case they really received his messages. Now, since time is short, I just want to point out that he made some very important speeches. First of all, when he compared Brussels to the to Moscow of the Soviet Union and to the to Vienna of the Habsburg Empire. He also, that was a public speech, he, he, an opener speech, if you want. He also made a speech in the parliament arguing that I do not believe in the European Union, I believe in Hungary. This was a total denial of double identity, Hungarian and European identities. Uh, nevertheless, there have been some paradoxical consequences of the reactions of the government to the criticism coming from abroad, from foreign countries, European institutions, and international organizations like OSC, the United Nations, the Bernice Committee, and so on, the knowledge of citizens who are interested in politics might have grown significantly because they learned the real functioning of the European political scene. For example, they now know that the European Parliament because it discussed the most salient Hungarian and European issues, like the media laws and the constitution, uh, and be especially because of a campaign in the right-wing media against Daniel Cohn-Bendit. Uh, many have learned, maybe again, that these are political groups in the, Euro in the European Parliament from European party families, which make decisions and uh, cooperate uh, with each other, and not the national blocs who sit in the European Parliament. So it was a strange learning process. At least. <coughs> Secondly, instead of a self-confident self Hungarian show for half a year, the work of the presidency in its narrower sense, fulfilling the program, chairing most of the council meetings, finding common solutions, and so on and so on, has been, as we talked about, overshadowed by the European wide protest that broke out uh, following the government actions back at home. 
there were committee hearings, plenary sessions in the European Parliament, and a multi-party resolution that <coughs> condemned the new national media laws, although the European People's Party voted against this resolution. Again, it was a non-intended non consequence that the Hungarian presidency probably contributed to the strengthening of the European public sphere. The overlap between the domestic and European political spheres has become bigger. The old resistance against the intervention of strangers into domestic affairs has been not blocked, and European political actors got actively involved in the heated debates about issues which cannot be interpreted anymore as internal competences. With an optimistic declaration, we might even say that maybe what belongs together grows together. That's also a sort of consequence. Now, thirdly, although we cannot speak of a routine presidency, according to my position, after which we just concentrate on the usual analysis, uh, and not to forget the trio presidency, the program, the original program of the trio presidency, Spain, Belgium, and Hungary, since it's not only a Hungarian presidency. In some crucial areas, the contribution of the Hungarian Council presidency to the progress was definitely significant. But again, there have been a lot of issues which were pushed forward or backward uh, by many different political and institutional players who are present in the European political arena. Moreover, the critical analysis of the outcome of the compromises cannot be neglected either. We cannot simply say this is a success and we don't talk about the content of any decisions. In other cases, however, the Hungarian presidency had no voice at all, and some of them were already mentioned, so I, I uh, uh, mostly skip this. Uh, although Orban proclaimed that the saving of the euro, as he used the term, was one of his priorities, it was Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy who did not, who haven't involved him into the uh, pre preparatory work and into the elaboration of their initiatives. And the Hungarian government even finally decided not to join the Euro Plus Pact. Probably the most spectacular feature of the presidency would have been the Eastern Partnership Summit in the castle of Gödöllő, but the meeting was postponed under obscure circumstances, and that will be the Polish presidency which will uh, organize this meeting. Uh, Yuri mentioned costs and benefits, and I totally agree that success and failure uh, reminds me these categories, which were an, again an invented dichotomy that characteristically framed our debates uh, during our whole accession process a couple of years ago, when the utilitarian dilemma, as you also mentioned, sounded like that. What were the advantages and disadvantages of joining the European Union, whilst the idea of the United Europe has been totally eroded in Hungary in the meantime? Uh, today, and that's my conclusion, today, as for Hungary and other member states, we face serious populist challenges to the European integration. During the first half of the year, Hungary was under the spotlights, and the salient negative phenomena of the actions of the government have been strongly criticized by many Democrats all, along, all around Europe and even outside Europe. This attention should not disappear just because the good or bad performance of the presidency has been just completed. And this is the most important lesson for all of us, uh, I think, that uh, we should be, remain in, in the spotlights of the European public sphere. Thank you for your uh, attention.